so yes, for those of you here for the first time, we'd like to know who you are. Who's here for the first time? I think I recognize everybody's face. We have no newbies in here today. Well, you each need to bring a friend next week. <laughs> so we can have some new people. We can get acquainted with somebody different and uh, expand our network here. Because the goal is to uplift and inspire and empower all those interested in the entrepreneurial journey, whether they've started or they're halfway through or even if they're complete, we all have some way of helping each other. And uh, that will let me segue into what this is all about. So One Million Cups, you all already know, um, is really about bringing us together, having a coffee, enjoying the time with each other, and then making the right connections, and really highlighting the entrepreneurs that are presenting their businesses. So. We would like you to participate even more today because you're all you're all like used to being here. So please um, ask your questions, even if you think that it might be a little bit of a struggle for the presenter. We've got to put them in those places because that's the only way that they are going to grow. Some of these presenters may um, have specific needs that they want from our audience. You might not be able to provide that, but you might know somebody else who can and the right uh, questions and commentary will lead to that. So please, I encourage you all to get involved. Um, we have an app. And our app, oh, I don't have my clicker. That's right, I'm not going to this slide. No, it's not your fault. So um, this is what our app looks like. If you haven't downloaded it on your phone yet, please do. It doesn't matter what kind of phone you have, unless it's from 1990. You should be able to get this app. Um, just put in one million cups, and then, uh, if, or if you go to our website, you can grab it from there. And select Dallas. You can follow some of the other chapters. They, they're in Fort Worth. Different team that runs it. Uh, Frisco, Addison, and um, Irving is going to launch soon as well. So here's where you'll find out who's presenting. And you can also comment, and this is a big deal. So you only have an hour after the presenter. So I guess by 10, I would say, by 11. 11, 11.30 I would say, you have that amount of time to give feedback through the app. And if you haven't checked in already, you can check in there as well. If you wait till tomorrow, you won't be able to. It won't work. It'll show you that to next week. And then people you can network with through the app. Okay? Any questions? No? Okay, cool. So uh, we will get started. I want to raise know that you are welcome to get up and grab a coffee if you want. Donald is our sponsor from Kiwi Tech. He'll be hanging out at his table. Uh, his company is looking for startups they can connect with and really build the startup ecosystem here financially. They, they invest in companies. Um, but we'll give we'll we'll mention a little bit more during the halftime between presenters. Um, and yeah, feel free to get up and grab a coffee anytime. So we will welcome from Concertal Systems, Bob, to the stage. He has six minutes to present and 15 minutes of Q&A. We'd like to stand up, as you all know, and give a round of applause. Thank you. I'm Bob Legis from Concertal Systems. I want to thank each of you for coming to One Million Cups this morning to learn about the company. So a few years ago, at the Design Automation Conference, there was a panel of industry experts that was posed the question, do you think we'll ever get to the point in the chip design industry where we can automate chip design going from ideas to actual designs with Lego like ease? And the consensus was, no, it's too difficult of a problem, it can't be done. Well, today, Concerto Systems is demonstrating the ability to do just that providing a competitive advantage to chip design companies that want to express their ideas in the silicon. And we're made up of a highly experienced team, collectively over 150 years of experience in the industry. I've got over 35 years of experience. I've got another high-tech company that's lasted over 20 years, started a design uh, uh, business unit for a multi-billion dollar semiconductor industry. I've managed worldwide uh, design centers and my team, collectively, we brought over 100 devices to market successfully. Couldn't do this without them. The semiconductor industry, last year, exceeded 400 and, uh, what, 19 billion dollars in sales. And these devices affected every aspect of our lives. I mean, most of you probably already checked your email today. 
probably did a little surfing on the internet, maybe even made a couple purchases. Um, maybe you said happy birthday to your mom. Uh, if you drove here, you might be uh, monitoring your fitness or your steps with a wearable. And, and our world is becoming even more, oops, more connected. I sort of messed up here, but let's see. It's even becoming more increasingly connected. Uh, where the information of everything that we do basically can be used collaboratively together to try to make our lives better. And the applications that, that are being developed last year, um, you know, are, are really, uh, you know, well, $58 billion last year was spent trying to develop new semiconductor devices for the industry. That's 14% of the revenue. And this is in applications like artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, um, automotive or advanced driver assistance, uh, even driverless car research, for instance. And all these things are affecting everything that we do and will continue to do so even to a, a greater extent in the future. And of that $58 billion, Conservatively speaking, over five billion dollars of that, that amount was spent with highly manual tasks. That's trying to take human ideas and specify them and actually implement them into silicon. Those manual tasks are what conserve systems is addressing. And we know that companies and engineers are looking for more efficient ways in order to bring devices to market. Last year, the industry spent over $3.6 billion leveraging off IP news. The CAGR, or the compound annual growth rate of the, of the IP news market, is outpacing the semiconductor market by almost two exponents. We think that the companies that are trying to leverage off IP news to do things more efficiently are in, will be interested in trying to automate the way all that comes together and works together. And the semiconductor industry is faced with a lot of challenges, right? whether it be chip complexity, with the most complex devices now exceeding over 10 billion transistors on a chip. The complexity is beyond what a human engineer can get their mind around in order to, to design and make it work. Time to market, you know, conservatively, one or two you know, calendar years to get a new product to market. These more complex devices can be even longer. And the development costs can be anywhere from a couple million dollars to over a half a billion dollars, or even more in some cases, in order to get these products successfully in the market. All these things pose significant risks to the industry. The stakes are really high. Trying to do this more efficiently is important. But the biggest risk factor and the largest cost contributor is the human effort that goes into these things. And that results in really lost opportunities for the not only the semiconductor market, but all the markets that the semiconductor market drives, whether it be communications, automotive, uh, medical, or really any aspect of our lives touch the semiconductor industry. So what we're doing at Conservative Systems is we're automating, once again, the creation of ideas into designs. We leverage off IP units, so you don't have to redesign the blocks again. But the way all that comes together is what we're simplifying it so you don't have to be a chip design expert to do the front end design. And obviously, you can reduce man months or even man years of effort into man days or man weeks of effort. Our technology is accessible. All you need is a web browser. And you can work collaboratively with a team through a web based environment. And uh, it's accessible. No, hard, no software installs. So, and like I said, what we're doing now is we're actually demonstrating this with a minimal viable product. This is not pie in the sky dream stuff. This is stuff we are demonstrating today. I'll use a web browser and basically you can select the functionality you know you want to integrate together and uh, start simulating automating it. We have a collection of. Uh, Disney once said it's kind of fun to do the impossible. We feel that's what we're doing for the chip design industry. So our first question um, from you, great job, great presentation. Our first question is, what can we as a community do for you? Well, um, a lot. Um, we're a pretty, pretty geeky bunch of conservative systems, obviously. Um, there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes that, that uh, you know, we don't talk about because we'll just move our audience. So 
this this format it is really important for me to get you know feedback from you guys on how understandable is what we're doing. Uh, we spent the last two years, for instance, in internal research and development, sort of with our heads, you know, below the sand a little bit. And now that we have our product, at the end of this month, we're going to use, uh, go to the design automation conference and start interacting with customers and sign up uh, first users of our technology. We've got some people that have been evaluating it that we really need to tune our message. So whatever feedback you guys can give us is really important. The other thing is we're a self-funded company. We haven't gone out looking for investors yet. Our vision has been really audacious. And we felt we needed to come to the market not only saying what we can do, but being able to demonstrate it before we start looking for investment dollars. We'll be beginning that, actually we've already started that casually, but we'll be doing that more seriously in the near future. So any feedback the audience has to sort of help us navigate those paths in the future would be really valuable. Uh, my name is Kudir Abdullah. I have a two-part question. Um, what makes you want to go into business for yourself? And then what does your target market look like? Um, the first question was what makes... What makes you want to go into business for yourself? <laughs> um, well, like I said, uh, we're a very experienced team. Um, living through this industry for decades, the industry's changed quite a bit. Chips are more complex than you've ever been before. You can't do it alone. The engineers can't do it. The industry really needs a new way to work together. And this technology is an enabling technology that allows that to happen. Because we're delivering the, the technology in a web-based environment, for instance, we can break down corporate walls. And the way we're delivering it allows IP developers who aren't part of the companies that are using our IP to interact with designers and their customers all in a collaborative environment. That's something that's really unique in this industry where typically as you go from one stage of development to the next, you're just throwing work over the wall. So to be able to do that is really important. The other thing that we've noticed over the, the last really decade is the industry has really moved more towards just doing, really selling and supporting their catalog products, except for the most expensive, most complex designs. And there's a lot of frustration in the market with OEMs or original manufacturing equipment providers that um, where they're, they're having trouble getting the differentiating new semiconductor devices that they really want. For instance, one of my uh, advisory board members is at Google. And at a previous job, we worked with him over six, seven months to try to define a new product that he wanted for, for, for a uh, research development project. And after that time, our organization basically said, well, we just don't have the people or the manpower to go off and do this. With this technology, that OEM can do the front end design himself. And then we can take the design and the customer, and then we can shop that to semiconductor manufacturers, for instance, and let them go through the back end flow and supply the products. Because someone has to build and stand behind the product. So, really, what we're doing, really, grew out of a frustration of, of the forces that we have seen in our jobs, you know, the way the market works and the way things have to change in order to be um, As far as who our target companies are, our target customers are, um, obviously chip design companies are our target customer, but engineers are actually our hardest customers, is the chip design experts that is. They sort of are usually control freaks and they want to be in control of the way they do it, and you sort of give that up when you go to an operator. But the OEMs that want new products, for instance, um, that's not so true. They just want their, their chips that do what they want to do. So, so, you know, depending on if we're short term or long term, the, the market focus and the customer base will, will change and develop as, as we mature as a company and as this technology continues to mature. Hi, um, I have a question. So, I actually work for a software company for um, I'm sorry, can you speak up? Um, I work for a software company for the electronic manufacturing industry, so very kind of similar market. Um, would this be directly for OEMs or OEMs, or would you gear it towards the engineers of the manufacturing companies as well? Um, as a question, and then the second part question is, do you have any competitors right now just in the, that kind of space of design? Well, I'm going to take the second question first, if you don't mind. As far as the competitors go, Anybody who designs chips in this obvious industry, industry is a potential competitor, but they're also a customer. 
because nobody is able to do automation for the types that we're doing, the things that we're doing right now. There, there's there's activity in the marketplace, like a company called Sci-Fi just raised over fifty million dollars in funding to try to to try to more efficiently bring products to market. But they don't have the automation technology. But if you listen to their pitch, for instance, um, their vision is to sort of do what we're able to demonstrate today. So we think that you know we don't. Their, their, their focus is different, they're coming at it a different way, but there, there's room for us to collaborate. For so that's really a good place for us to be. Um, which I think also makes our patents more valuable. Um, we're sort of the really first in, in this area. As far as um, you know, who this applies to, we leverage highly off IP units. And that obviously affects chip design. But it also affects Things that we automate actually can be applied to all aspects of the way that IP goes through the manufacturing flow as well as building products that use those sort of things. And the evaluation systems for customers to consider using those products. The software that's used to drive those allows us to do a, 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 you know, a common, basically, a driver interface, for instance, through a, a unique uh, method of operation in the way our chips are designed. So, so we're concentrating on, on the chip design first, but the automation, because we take a holistic view, and because we're not just about stitching the stuff together, but, but about extending the way that's reused through all aspects of the way it actually operates, collaborating with the system, as a system, even beyond the chip, that applies basically to OEM oh, yeah, product development. And we'd like to move in that direction, but we can't do everything right. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, who would be your typical client and what would be the typical cost of the project? Okay. So, um, once again, back in the we take a holistic view, anybody who uses a new semiconductor device could potentially be a client. Now, we're focusing first off um, some strategic partnerships to establish those, like with the back-end manufacturing firm. And there's a company, I can't name it right now, that has been evaluating us. Um, they typically take designs from designers and they'll manufacture them for them. So a partnership with a company like that is, is very complimentary. It allows them to actually move into the front end design and allows us to offer manufacturing parts as well. So the clients basically, it's all about challenge. Um, that's an existing company with existing channels to companies that want to do, you know, new innovative devices. So that could be, uh, you know, a lot of one-offs, but their channels and their FAEs can manage that for us. Can you name a couple? Not necessarily one we can't mention, but some of the competitors. Anybody doing an FAE? Let me just, any company, familiar with FPGAs, design and cemetery devices, those are like programmable hardware devices. You don't have to manufacture, but you can sort of turn to gate level logic with what you want with it. Those are devices that you can buy shelf today. And their customers are all over the board as far as designing things that those parts can do. We apply not only the chip design, but the design of what goes in on those things. So those are things that, that basically are lower hanging fruit. We can go in and we can be just a contractor some proof of concept or really some market success stories relatively quickly, for instance. So any company that has an FPGA in it that needs to make that do what they want them to do, we can go in and as an engineering contract company just do that for them. We can use this technology ourselves to build an OEM product. Um, those customers are all over the board, whether it be the North Romans of the world that that you know literally have you know thousands of designs that they need to do or whether it be an evaluation system for uh, proving out a new chip design before they actually choose to manufacture. Um, and there's no shortage of new chip designs, that, but the, the verification and validation of those designs before they go is, is really, in a lot of cases, uh, takes up 50% of the revenue that's spent in the new design development stage. So we, we could very easily go in and apply this technology to, to really lower those costs and really get them so that's the whole point of the design automation conference. Um, this is our first public offering and exchange in a broad sense of people that are looking to do design more efficiently. And 
so this is sort of exploratory for us to some extent. And then we want to, well, hopefully we'll be able to cherry pick it. But you know, the big question that we're faced with right now is, anybody we talk to, the first thing we're gonna ask is, is okay, who's using you today? And what success stories do you have? Well, we've, we're just coming out of R&D. We're just applying this to the first design. We have some proof of concept designs, but no, no, no paying customers. We're pretty right now. So that's, that's our problem right now for the next six months to get those success stories. And then once, I think after we, we sort of evaluate as we go through that stage, we'll be able to sort of churn and hopefully we want to go. Now, the markets that we're going to are things like multi-core designs, where you have very large designs with a lot of functionality, and you integrate that together and it's doing collaboratively together. Automation makes a lot of sense in those areas. So there's a company, for instance, like uh, Cornama that's looking to uh, do massive parallel processing. Companies that are sort of in that space are like the NVIDIA space for a particular purpose. But you look at like artificial intelligence, the hardware may be that efficient. You know, it's still an open book, that chapter's not right in the market. So it's an evolving market that's going to drive our customers. Obviously, we want to help drive that, we want to you know, latch on to the, the successful partners in those spaces. Morning. My name is Rocky. Hey, Rocky. I have a question. I, I see that. This is uh, definitely applicable to someone who's a little bit more advanced, like an engineer. But I see that you simplify the process that maybe the, the home inventor or someone who wants to create a widget or a product to come out um, in the market space or a small business owner, you potentially provided a pathway to do that with this. There's always been a cost uh, issue to be able to make some kind of hardware circuit. And that's that's been one caveat, so it seems like you're finesse the way for, you know, to help the inventor maybe a liaison, something with the chip maker. But how are you reaching this home demographic market outside of the engineer space? Because it seems like it's a very niche space, but you have a very broad product that could really apply to, you know, uh, the everyday person who doesn't have the technical kind of knowledge that you're, you're bringing. So how are you reaching that demographic that wants to create the next, you know, the next great product or the next great widget that, you know, potentially could tap into your resource? Right, so, you're right, we're very broadly applicable technology. And trying to be all things to all people right off the bat for a startup, I think is a recipe, it's a disaster recipe, if you will. Um, it'll pull us in a thousand different Directions. It'll keep us from focusing on the big ones where the big problems are, where they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, for instance, developing the most complex chips. So you're absolutely right that delivering this technology is a game changer. It really opens the door even for the home users. And uh, I think the, the way we're going to be, uh, you know, trying to you know, begin going in that direction is not just opening up broadly to everybody, but opening up to universities first, and graduate students, and things, and allow them to use it freely internally and build up some, you know, they'll write papers for us and what they do with it, hopefully. I mean, it's, it's really good give and take. Plus, they can actually contribute to the IP libraries that can be opened up commercially in other areas, too, and it can generate revenue streams possibly for them if, if their organizations allow them to do that. I think that's a smarter way to do it. Um, but what we really want to do is we really want to go after the, the, the companies that can really target us into, into products and we can get big cost savings with, you know, with a simplified effort and a very focused effort. Um, we're only scratching the surface on what we can do with system design automation technology for the the chip is on the industry. What we have developed is very, it works very well, but it, it really um, can be uh, applied and specialized in a lot of different ways for a lot of different type of devices. And that all can be done under the hood and expanded on in the future. And the things that's going to drive our selection as far as those area markets, as far as how we, we, we um, really um, pretty broaden out what we can do under the hood, is really going to depend upon those customers we engage with that can help fund that extra development we want to focus. So I'd rather that be customer driven than just broadly driven by, by how 
small users, users that really don't have the wherewithal to, to really fund that effort. We have to build a viable business first. Once that's built, then I think we can broaden up to the audience in time. Thank you, Bob. Great. Uh, great time. Dialogue. Stick around if you'd like to speak with Bob afterwards. Um, so, quick thing, we want to thank all of our sponsors. So, obviously, we're sitting in the deck, and everybody has already heard that the deck is moving to a new location. Um, they continue to be our sponsor, and we continue to run one million cups in this space for the um, month of June. We'll still be here, so please continue to meet us every Wednesday, and we will move over to the Centrum July 11th. So July 4th, we all know it was a holiday, but you might question, is one million cups still happening? The answer is no. We are going to take that holiday as well, and we expect you to, you to do the same thing. And then we'll, we'll see you on the 11th at uh, the Centrum. Um, you can also go to our website to continue to look for updates. We will have a banner there if anything changes with this location. But as far as we know, we'll continue to be here in June. Um, so thank you to the deck for being our partner. Uh, we also want to thank her too. They continue to be our onboarding partner as well. They're not always with us. Um, Mercia has another business outside of running his streets business, but when he's able to be here with us, he is with us. So we, we always have to keep um, her two treats on the on the board here. Um, and Michael Bruno, who's uh, our video sponsor, he is always with us. He's here taking pictures right now. Um, feel free to connect with him if you're interested in any video production. And uh, Kiwi Tech is our new coffee sponsor. They will be with us this week and next week. And I have a message from them, which is Kiwi Tech is an integrated innovation ecosystem designed to assist early stage businesses with tech, capital, <coughs> mentorship, and go-to market support, thus providing great value, great value vetted deal flow to investors and disruptive ideas for large corporations and user groups to adopt. So Donald is here with us. He's usually in Austin, but he will be with us this weekend, next week. Um, so have a, a chance to connect with him. And finally, uh, High Brew, they usually join us once a month. It's usually the last Wednesday of the month or the first Wednesday of the month. So that's it for our sponsor message. We are going to segue into our second presenter, Barbara. Barbara is here with Smarty Symbols. So we'll learn about her, her company and what they're up to. And you can maybe have a hashtag if you wanted to use her and at um, a Twitter account, just at Smarty Symbols. Welcome, Barbara. Can we give her a round of applause? Thank you. Let's see if I can do this. Um. to make sure that you are with me. So first I'll say, my name is Barbara, and I'll say good morning, and you guys say good morning, Barbara, okay? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Barbara. Good job. Now that I know you guys are here, um, before I can talk about Smartest Symbols, I have to give you guys some background about the market that is currently placed. So think about the last time you went looking for a restroom on a trip or in a public space. Did this image come to your mind? So this is a symbol that represents restroom. It doesn't matter if you are in the United States or if you travel abroad, you will see this exact symbol everywhere. And it helps you find restrooms faster, even if you can't read that word restroom. Now, that is what we call a visual support. It gives you visual information about the world around you. And it does help us understand how to navigate things better. Children with autism and other kids with special needs have really shown to benefit even more from these various visual support that we have around us. You know, another type of visual support is that stop sign, for example. It makes you stop. It's that red sign that you remember, and I know you can actually picture that in your mind right now. 
Now, if we know that it's professionals, that these special supports have been helping students, what would you imagine that educators have been doing with this information? They have been using visual support everywhere, in everything. If you walk into a special education classroom today, you will see signs about um, no hitting each other, about the schedule they're going to do throughout the day. Even in a regular ed classroom, if you have kids, you know they also use visuals for everything that they teach in the classroom. Kids, not just kids with autism special needs, but actually everybody, all of us, think the restroom side learn from various visual support. Now, where the smartest symbol fits in all this? We have actually created 22,000 symbols to represent words from general communication. And if you think, for example, of that image there of the girl, and that represents to curse, imagine if you're to Google that word to find an image to put in a classroom of the word curse. Probably the teacher would not be able to use it in a classroom. Now, um, what we focus on is actually creating images that represent words. So we're not going to be designing a cute girl with a flower with a pretty dress that has no actual meaning. We, we create images that represent words for communication and learning. Now, if you think of these images over here, we have a vocabulary that these images are actually represent, representing. The top one is trust, snob, unique, and responsible. It would be really challenging to even go on a Google search to try to find something to represent these various vocabulary words that kids need to learn in school. So today, Smartest Symbols is a collection of 22,000 symbols, and that's how we actually started. Our goal was actually to create a library with all these different images that represent words for communication and learning. But we have grown into something much bigger. We actually created a place where teachers not only access these images and these different vocabulary words, but they actually can use our platform to simply drag and drop these images and words into like a bingle activity and just create a material for that classroom to use that day. So this is some examples of what the website looks today. Um, my customers are going to be the speech therapist, a special education teacher, or a parent of a child with autism. In our revenue model, we have a direct customer, a teacher actually spending money out of their own pocket to buy my system and use it. We have purchase from the school district and also licensing to other app developers like the app that I use today to show you guys. That's using my images. So these are some examples of what teachers are actually creating with my images. All got, I got this from Instagram from other teachers. These are all my images. And just some fun facts about Smartest Symbols. The website was launched in 2014. We have been growing our revenue with 60% year over year. It's just two employees. It's still a home-based business. And it's still my part-time gig. Thank you so much for being here today. <laughs> and I guess you guys can ask me tons of questions. Uh, the first question is, what can we as a community do for you? I'm glad you asked that. So, I am an educator. I'm a speech pathologist. Um, business is something that I'm learning on the side as I go on this. And on my efforts of trying to learn and grow in business, one thing that I really believe that the direction that I need to do now is to actually scale this business. This is like my big struggle, right? It's still my side gig. We're profitable, but not at the point where I'm ready to like hire sales people, marketing, all of these other things that come with tons of money. Um, so I'm looking for mentorship. So if you feel like, okay, no, I like this, I feel like I can help her, I can give her information, I'm here, I love that. Um, and I think what, what I imagine, and this is um, what I perceive as my next step, is actually trying to build a sales team of independent sales representatives to go to these school districts to sell my product directly to the schools. Um, it's, it is really flattering that teachers are spending money from their own pocket to buy my product, but I don't think that's right. So 
Today, the teacher actually, either they spend money from their own pocket and then try to get reimbursed later on, or they just, you know, say, this is what I'm spending money on, they live with it, right? Um, so, I would love to be able to have a team of sales reps that would go to the school and make them uh, have this software available to the teachers in their schools. How you doing? My name is Peter uh, yeah. I, I think it's a really, really cool idea. Um, first question is, is there any other language besides English? And second, have you thought about um, possibly like giving part of your um, sales to like a foundation like autism or you know, giving back to like somebody else's why? Those are great. So, so two things. Uh, I'm originally from Brazil. Um, and that app that I showed earlier is an app that I actually created for my other business that also is powered with the images that people use to communicate. And that is available in Portuguese. So we're in the process now of translating. There are some uh, softwares I use my images that have translated. We got together and translated it into Portuguese and we have it in Spanish, but not yet for the 22,000 symbols. Um, the, the challenge of translation here is it's, it can never be a direct translation, right? So sometimes we're trying to look at the image to see what actually the meaning is to find the vocabulary word. That, of course, takes manpower and people actually understand translations that are just translating word by word. Um, and yes, I would love to be able to give back. My son actually has autism. And it's something that I, it wasn't planned, of course, but I've been doing this before I had my child, which I always tell people, I feel like he picked me to be his mom because I'm creating all the school things for people with autism. Um, he's just four. Um, he has a type of autism that would necessarily be using this to communicate, but he, we use this, we use my images in my house to help him with visual schedules. So I can tell him that when we wake up in the morning, first we brush our teeth, then we put clothes on and then we go to school. When he wakes up and there's a different day, he will go to my refrigerator and he'll look. Uh, we have an actual month calendar, so we're going to Canada next month. And he knows the exact day that he can look for the picture of a flag of Canada on that day. Um, then he'll go to Canada. So even though he's very verbal, he doesn't he doesn't need words through pictures to communicate, he uses my images as a way to understand the world and navigate things better on time like it to kind of just stay safe. Morning, my name is Rocky. Uh, I had, so I actually work in healthcare and I treat um, mostly seniors, uh, patients, a lot of post-stroke, a lot of Parkinson's patients. And I saw what you were doing in it and I found it to be very um, applicable to the patient population that I treat. So we use picture cards and picture books all the time with our speech therapists, our occupational therapists, to have patients who have struggles communicating sometimes after an acute event. And they struggle, obviously, to communicate, but they can still do gross motor and point things out. And I find this to be remarkable because having those picture cards or even those picture books, they're cumbersome. Patients can't carry that stuff around. But they do somehow always seem to have their phones around and things like that. And I found when you were pressing these buttons to be able to communicate something like I need to use the toilet or I, I need water, I think that would be brilliant for a market, I think, above and beyond just used for children. There's, there's millions of post-stroke, dementia, um, so many medical you know, neurodegenerative diseases out here that I think you, you have a brilliant product that could apply to that market. So have you looked into that? I space? am like so glad you asked it, and I'm like going crazy here. And it almost feels like I paid you to ask me that question. <laughs> the reason is, is um, I take tips. The market has always always focused on children. However, with that in mind, I actually created an entire character set so that the user can pick their character to represent that word so that they feel more connected. So if you see here on my logo, this here is our elderly character. 
So we have a whole set of characters. So you have an African American character, you have a female character that the user that's going to ultimately be using these images to communicate, they can actually pick their character. So if it's an elderly person using for somebody had a phage or a stroke, they can, instead of using kid looking characters, represent them. Because ultimately that's what they're doing. They, they have something, somebody eating when they want to eat and they hand over their card, press that button, they can actually pick somebody that's more appropriate to their age and what they look like. Yeah. Hi, I think this is a great idea, especially in the way that you are using it for uh, classroom teachers. But is there, are you um, tracking outcomes or progress of students who um, have this in their classrooms and um, from year to year or beginning to year to end of year, how much they have progressed by using this system? Right, so I'm not inventing the idea that pictures can be used to exchange communication. This is something that the industry, people have always used and research does show that not only has been shown to improve communication outcomes for, for example, kids that aren't speaking yet, you start teaching them uh, how to exchange pictures to communicate. So if I want to eat a cake, I'll give them a picture of a cake and they'll get a cake in return that actually speeds up the rate that they start speaking um, and enables more verbal communication, uh, but also visuals for learning. So I can invent that part, right? There is another company that is the household name that was done in the 80s. They have maybe 10,000 images that still look like it was designed in the 70s, 80s. It's that young Caucasian male character stick figure, and they've been using this for a long time. When, so what I'm bringing is the innovation, the change, the characters, the ease of use with my site, the number of vocabulary we're constantly building, um, all of this other side of the research and how much this is impacting has, it's almost like one of these known things in the education field already. Can you walk us through a little bit of what you're currently doing to market and get in front of your target customers? Okay, so in case you didn't hear, it's uh, what I'm doing to uh, my market efforts. I'm sucking at this, right? Oh. Um, a friend of mine said, you know, I think you have something good because you're selling. It's selling itself. This is basically what my product's doing today, right? My effort is minimal. The product sells itself. My customers post on Instagram. I have like 10,000 followers on Instagram often reposting of my customers using my images in the classroom, everywhere, with their kids. And of course we repost it and people love it. Um, I have nobody doing marketing but me. Um, so yeah, my marketing efforts are like them. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, um, I love the idea and I believe in your mission and you know it is wonderful. Um, I would like to talk with you afterwards because my company makes websites super fast and automatically and we will let you provide our service for free for you. Um, now the, the couple of questions I have. Um, what would it take for you to go full time in this? Because you have customers, you have traction, why are you having still you know, shampoo uh, and full time? Um, I, yeah, I'm, let me uh, guess, correct the record. I'm full time running two businesses. This is my second business. My first business made apps for the iPad which is that app that I showed in the introduction. That's how the whole image is started. I was making my apps uh, for iPad, educational apps for speech therapy, and I needed images. I wasn't gonna license them from somebody, so I started hiring people to make my own images. Next thing I knew, I had 2,000 images. Um, and then 3,000 people were like, Barbara, can we use this on our own software? I'm like, sure, I'll license it to you. So I licensed to other developers, and then teachers wanted to use the images. Barbara, can you let me use these images in my classroom? I'm like, you know what? I think I need to do something with these images. When I had 10,000 images, then I launched the Smartest Symbols. Um, so yes, even though it's not my full-time gig, it's still kind of is my full-time gig running two business at the same time. My, my second question has to do with, do you have any plans Instead of licensing the images, say, if licensing some API, so if I want to create an application or something and I want to have, you 
know, something I can connect to your server and you can still have the API access to our universe. I think that will help you to have explanation. Um, yeah, I mean, that's not something I've thought yet. Uh, I think I need to build my solid, make sure my customers are happy with my solid business, improving my features. It's kind of my focus today. It's been, uh, but this is something that definitely, I guess, as the company grows, hopefully, and things, you know, get adding people instead of me splitting my time to other possible ventures. Um, that's definitely a good idea to suggest. Thank you. It is a subscription based, yeah. So teachers pay $45 a year for um, accessing the whole thing or $9 a month. And then another side of the business is I have a commercial license subscription. Uh, there's this big thing called Teachers Pay Teachers where teachers create their own materials and a PDF file basically. Something they use for a lesson and they can put it for sale. I was, you know, from the beginning, even before Smart Assembly started, when it was just my app business, all these teachers were like, Barbara, can you license these images so that we can create a product to sell? And when, when I started Smart Assembles, we had this commercial license, which is also subscription based, that is in a higher tier, it's so over $200 or $30 a month, that you can access all my images and put it for sale on a PDF format on Teachers Pay Teachers, um, which has been great for my business because we also have affiliate marketing. And so as teachers are creating products and putting for sale, people see those images and they're like, oh, I like this, I want to make my own, I want to modify. They can come to my site and make their own. The affiliate gets that 10% and I get a new customer. So it's almost this letting these people using for commercial purposes has really boosted in my sales really naturally. The same happened with app developers. So there's another company that we licensed back in 2014. 2014, um, it's also an app for kids with autism. They have a huge community of parents that use this app every day to have their kids. And they want to make more materials, like the refrigerator thing that I was talking about. So they come to my site, they subscribe, they see which images are you using here. Can I have access to it? So the developers just send them back to my site, they subscribe, they can create materials for their kids at home. Awesome. One last question. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, it's easy. No, I'm not saying one last question. Like, I could take one more. Um, where would you like to see this business go? Like, do you have a sort of a roadmap you'd like this to be sold to one company and make whatever and retire? Or do you see yourself in this business ongoing and just you haven't really thought that far? It is a hard question. I've thought of both possibilities, right? Um, I really would love to stay on uh, for a long time and seeing see it be, become the household name that it deserves to be. The household name now doesn't deserve to be where it is. Um, and for that, I do need sales reps. I need people to knock on these doors. I need to increase my marketing effort more on, a, on boots on the ground kind of type of enterprise here where I didn't even know it existed before until two months ago when somebody does have a software education company and he has 40 sales reps and he goes to these different school districts and say, hey, look, I, I know that if their admin or their teacher sees my product, they will buy it. But I need somebody, a group of people who will knock on those doors to sell my product so that teachers aren't spending that money. What then will you think about selling the business? <laughs> um, right, right. No, I mean, it's tricky, right? Because I'm not coming from a business side. And I know that maybe, you know, I always tell people, sometimes I feel like my business is when I go to college and I'm holding it back from my, because of my lack of experience in business, right? But I know my business. I know my customers. I've used this as a professional and I've used it in my own home as a parent. So even thinking 10 years from now, um, I'd love to be part of my business one way or the other, even if it's not as the person who knows how to grow businesses, because that's not what I went to school for. My dedication is to my 
like kids, right? Special needs community. That's kind of where my passion has always been. Uh, which is maybe why this kind of sells itself. Um, and then there's the question of the other business. Maybe the other business will sell, and then, or maybe they're both grow together. I don't know. I think it's one thing after the other. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, everyone. That was an awesome day. I mean, we have quite an intimate audience, and, and I don't know if that made it easier to get questions out or not, but anyway, I hope you all got value out of it. You're welcome to stick around and connect personally with each entrepreneur. Um, just so you know, normally we do have the co-working, and we do see that there's desks still here, but actually we're not able to invite you to stay and continue to co-work. It's not an option today. But you are welcome to hang out and interact with people. I don't really have a time to say, oh, we've got to go by 10.30. If you're having great conversations, continue those conversations. Just kind of stay in this area, but we don't have permission to co work with that here. Um, our sponsor message, our, our, our sponsor info is here, and Donald is still here. If you'd like to connect with him and learn about how, um, you know, what they're doing in, in our ecosystem and how they can benefit your business. Uh, they do help with investments for finding investors, so connect with Donald. Um, and I also want to say that we are looking for two new coordinators to join our team. So I am going to run through just a quick info session. Uh, you don't have to stay in this seat if you don't want to. You can definitely just start talking. I will start it in about five minutes. But just so you know that I'm going to be talking with the mic here to those that are interested in learning a little bit more about what happens behind the scenes. So, uh, oh yes, I need to announce something about uh, a really cool event coming up on Tuesday. It, um, how many of you have heard about Brazen? Uh, I know I have. Okay. Good. Most of the ladies in the room, that's awesome because that's who it's for. It's for the ladies, but obviously we welcome the men to get involved too because you guys, um, I mean, we support each other. Uh, but Brazen is a business that is being launched in Dallas by Jasmine Brand, who's also part of uh, launch DFW, and the purpose of Brazen is to empower and inspire female entrepreneurs. Um, I think there's the stat that keeps being announced is something like only 2% of female businesses actually get funded, but there's a ton of money out there for our businesses to be funded. We just don't know how to access that money. So a company like Brazen is being pulled together in order to help us succeed. Um, and more to collaborate instead of compete with each other because I think sometimes women, um, and this is a personal opinion, um, I haven't had this experience myself, but from what other people have shared and just from what I've read, it seems like a lot of times women um, are not necessarily help, equipped to help each other because it's so hard for us to succeed in the first place. But this is not what that's about, it's about we're going to help each other and we're all awesome. So Grayson is having their uh, sort of launch event for the Fort Worth. Um, city, the city of Fort Worth. We did it in Dallas last night. Oh no, sorry, in Irving. It happened in Irving at the study last night, so if you missed it, it was a good session. I'm sorry you missed it, but you can uh, plug in with the Fort Worth event, which is happening where, Gigi? At 411. Oh, the place is called The 411. Um, so you can just Google that or go to Brazen's website, which is uh, brazenglobal.com, I believe, and all the info will be there. So. Fort Worth Tuesday at what time? 5.30 p.m. Hope to see you there. Or in let some other ladies that are entrepreneurs, or even if she's not an entrepreneur yet, but she's thinking about it, great place to be. And she is welcome. Okay, yeah, that's it. I will uh, circle back here in about five minutes. Interact, have coffee, have fun. Thank you for coming and join us next week, same place, same time.